Amen. Okay, so uh, last week's question uh, that we answered was on denominations, and I got a lot of response back from several of you. It was, uh, I was a little bit academic for part of it, but there was kind of a question underneath the question. Do you guys remember that? Like, there were denominations, and we could talk about the history of denominations, church divisions, but uh, really what was underneath it was that some of you have been hurt by church divisions in the past. And that was really what was underneath that whole thing. And I really got that word loud and clear from many of you in your reactions to last week's message. So that was the one that was asked the most. It was asked five times. Today's question was only asked one time. But the reason I'm going after it is the second one is because I think it was the most honest and very heartfelt, this question. So here you go. This week's question, why do people say that you cannot miss what God has for you, I call bull crud. And that's the way they wrote it, by the way. I did not sanitize that for us. Free will makes that a false statement, doesn't it? As a people, we're not very obedient either. Now, there's a lot in there, but do you sense the rawness of it? You can't miss God, can you? Somebody told that to them, and then they felt like they missed God. And then they ask this question about free will. Like, don't we get to make choices? Because if you can make your own choices for good or bad, then surely you could miss God, right? And um, this, this kind of leads us to two big things today. First off, it leads us to a, a big theological debate that's been raging in the church for quite a while, back to the whole denominations conversation. But it also takes us to a deeper question that we'll get to at the end. So what's the huge debate been all about? Um, so it's something called free will or God's sovereignty, predestination, some of the terms that people use for it, the doctrines of grace, Calvinism, Arminianism. Are you bored yet? Is everybody okay? Like <laughs> some people, like, and this was the way last week, like some folks were like, man, that was a lot, Pastor, you know, at the end. Others were like, man, I could have stayed there all day learning more and more about that church history. So depending on who you are today, you may have a similar reaction. We'll see. Um, but I'm not going to go master's level deep into this. We're just going to mostly touch the scriptures on it. But for those of you who grew up with this maybe, or you've studied this in the past, this is the Calvinism, Arminianism uh, debate or question. And um, for those of us that aren't familiar with those terms, what they've done is they've kind of looked at how somebody gets saved. Sometimes we really simplify it, right? And we imagine Billy Graham in front of one of his crusades and just saying, come forward, pray a prayer, and get saved, would you? And, and, and sometimes it feels just that simple. And some of our own experiences and testimony, it's been that simple. But the theologians who are like analyzing these verses, like right down to the detail, they will, they will give you what are called steps or stages of salvation. Some of them have 10 stages of salvation or 15. And they've analyzed it and it's got to happen in this order and in this way. And here's your part. And here's God's part. Um, if you geek out on that kind of stuff, great for you. Um, I will just say that to um, reformed denominations and um, uh, maybe Wesleyans or Methodists, this has been a really big issue for some of them. They come down on different sides of this question. Um, people like Baptists or non-denominationals, we kind of don't know what we are in this particular debate. And that's also okay. There's times to come to the scripture and to say, there seems to be mystery here, and I embrace the mystery. And so that's okay. <laughs> that's an okay conclusion to come to. Um, I'll leave that between the Lord and you, but we're going to look at the verses right now. A uh, couple of other disclaimers. First off, this is brainy. Um, but having a Christian faith does not mean checking your brain at the door. So there's a verse that says that we should love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And sometimes we think that we're supposed to leave our mind out of it, that it should be such a simple faith. We shouldn't have to look at the complexities. And I will say our faith is simple and accessible to anyone but that doesn't mean that it's not fun plumbing the depths of an almighty God. 
So that's where your brain comes in. So anyway, this particular doctrine, free will versus um, God's sovereignty, um, it kind of dives into, um, do we truly have free will to choose good or bad in every single situation? Are we so sinful that we need almost a miracle inside of our souls to find God? Um, I would say, I hold this with an open hand. We talked about that last week too. Um, this is not a major doctrine I don't believe. There are major doctrines, maybe seven or eight of them, like Jesus is the son of God for sure. And nobody else is. And your Bible is the inspired word of God and it is the one authority for all faith and life. Like those are, there are things like that, that I would say, these are foundational stones. And if you start to shift these things, I'm not even sure you're in Christianity anymore, but this idea of about free will versus predestination or God's sovereignty, I would say that's not a major for me. Amen. We can disagree on that in this church and we can still be brothers and sisters and love each other. Amen. Okay. So that's how we're going to look at that. So for very first verse, Romans chapter six, let's go. Romans six. This is kind of the, um, uh, this is the God's sovereignty strain of thought. We're going to start here. We're born slaves to sin. This might be a surprise to some of you. He says, thank God, once we, you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching that we have given you. Paul's talking to a group of Christians here and says, in your previous life, before Jesus, you used to be a slave to sin. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. So there's a, a state of a person who, who hasn't found Jesus Christ yet, hasn't surrendered to him yet. And the way Paul talks about it here is like, you were so broken and under the control of this old system it was like slavery. You didn't even have an option to choose God. Like of all the options that were out there, this tool was not even on your tool belt, so to speak. Like that's how broken the human race is. Some theologians call this original sin. We're born into original sin. It's the idea that Adam and Eve in the garden, some of you guys know that story, before they ever sinned, and they were in this perfect state with God of relationship, friendship, that they had never sinned. And because they had never sinned, they had the freedom of will. They could choose to obey God, or they could choose to reject him. And once they first chose to reject him, sin entered the world. And that's why we say the world was cursed. Because the first man and the first woman passed down to their kids. Not just DNA, they passed down a spiritual curse to them as well. And so that freedom to actually choose good or bad was no longer passed down. We are now enslaved to sin. Amen. We're so confused. We're so broken. <clears throat> Some of you guys had what you would call a good upbringing with good parents. They were still broken and they still scarred you, yes? And some of you had very difficult parents or very distant parents and they scarred you a lot. No matter what, we've been scarred and not just by parents, but by school systems. And we've been scarred by culture and we've been scarred by countless things surrounding us and original sin has come into the picture been passed down through the generations until now. We are slaves to sin is what he's trying to call it there. Romans 3 verse 10, we're all helpless. As the scripture says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is even seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one is good. Not a single one. That's a really happy verse. Yes. So happy and optimistic. It's like, you have no chance is what that verse is saying. And not only do you have no chance because no one's even seeking God, but the track record of humanity is that nobody's done it. Not even one. He says it multiple times in there. So you don't even have the ability to find God today. So you're, you're in a state of sin slavery and you don't have the ability to find God. And, and that really messes with us. It really messes with us as Americans, doesn't it? Because we're so about our rights and we're so about what we choose to do. We're so about like self-fulfillment and my own destiny and my own purpose and pulling myself up from my own bootstraps and all that good stuff that this kind of talk about like, I don't even have a way to find God if I wanted to, that really bothers us. Wait a second. 
What do you mean I can't? Here's a way to think about it. It's almost as if your options are limited. It, 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 it's not just that, that you're choosing badly over and over again. It's, it's that your options aren't even there. So for instance, if Jeff Bezos, do you know who that guy is? He's the CEO like, of Amazon and super, super wealthy. Like he and I walked into a car dealership together. Which of us two, me or Jeff, has the most options there? Right, like, like you wouldn't look at that in, in normal free will language. You would just say, Jeff has all the options and Josh has very few, if any. <laughs> right, it's just, they just aren't on your tool belt, man. It's no big deal. Or let's say Dwayne The Rock Johnson and I walked into a Gold's Gym together. <laughs> right, sure. How many of us has a greater capacity to execute our will that day? See, I might wish it, but I don't have the, the ability to execute, yes? He does much more. Amen. So we're limited, and, and the Bible says you're way more limited in your power and your ability than you think you are. You like to come to the table and think, I could follow Jesus anytime. Hmm. And then let's talk about your limitation of desire and of character as well, because it doesn't stop with ability. Let's talk about the limitations of your desires today. Like for instance, you might all desire to live um, perfect physical fitness every day of your life. Anybody wish that? Most of us do. So why don't we have it? The reason is donuts. And it's not just donuts, it's, it's um, maple glazed bacon donuts even. <laughs> and when you face that bacon donut, there's a question about your desire for the donut versus your desire for total physical fitness. And one of your desires is stronger because look at us, right? <laughs> One of your desires is stronger, and it's, it's stronger a lot, you know, or it's the gym, and it's like my, the, 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 the greater desire is to hit the snooze button rather than go to the gym. It's just all of the stuff, right? Like, we are limited by our desires that are so much stronger. Our desire for what's unhealthy is stronger than our desire for what's healthy in most areas of our life. And now let's go to character. Well, what limitations do you have in your character? We talked before about culture and education and all the things that are broken in this world that surround you. But think about your upbringing for a second. Like there are some folks who grew up with abuse in the, in the home. And when you grew up with abuse in the home, do you face all your adult choices um, objectively, neutrally? Like when you're gonna have a, a relational conflict with an authoritarian figure are you going to face that with fear or are you going to face that with courage and this is a new adventure and let's work this out? And some of you are going to face that differently because of your background, because of what was done to you and because of what you've lived through, your reactions, you don't have as many choices as somebody else in this room might have. Some of you grew up in poverty. And there wasn't enough to go around. And there were days without food, days without meals. Some of you guys lived through that. And so in your adult life, there's a, there's a poverty mentality. There's not going to be enough. I have to get there first. And I have to shove some other people down when I get there to make sure that I get mine. Because if I don't get mine, there's not going to be enough to go around. And I'll go without again like I used to. Do you see how those experiences have hardwired us? Like if I could bring a psychologist, a real psychologist in here today, they could go into depth on all the different ways that we're all hard hardwired. The biblical way to talk about it is you're a slave to sin. You're a slave to the brokenness of your past. What was handed down to you by Adam and Eve, but also by your parents and also by their parents and so how many options do we actually have at the morality buffet here? Far fewer than we thought we did. That's what the Calvinists are saying. And I agree with them on this point. John chapter six, verse 64. 
But there are some of you who do not believe. And this is a moment where Jesus is talking about talking to his 12 disciples. And he's got Judas there who does not believe. And he's got 11 guys who do believe. Jesus knew from the beginning those who were... Uh, who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my father. He said, you don't even get to become a Christian unless God the father says so and gives you some kind of a supernatural ability to get past all the bondage that you used to be in. Like there's some kind of a thing that has to happen and nobody gets to salvation without supernatural help. That's what he just said there in John 6. And then he says this, and this is Paul in Philippians 2, says our will and our action also come from God. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And that's so specific, so clear. Like you don't have the will to do it and you don't have the power to follow through. You have neither of those things. It is only the power of God in you that allows you to do that. And what's really tweaky about this particular verse is it's not talking about salvation. It's talking about every God-loving act in your life. So we don't just need amazing grace to get saved. You need it to do anything. Amen. Woo! Is it? knock you down a few notches. It does me. Every time you guys make me study this topic, my goodness, it's a roller coaster of emotion. Because it's like, without thinking about it, I tend to, in the picture, I tend to make myself bigger and God a little bit smaller. And then when I come and I have to confront these verses all over again, all of a sudden I start to shrink in size and God gets bigger. And guess what? My thankfulness goes up because I realized just how much grace there is involved in all of this. Okay, so that was all one side. Like you have no chance, you need the grace of God or nothing. Now let's go into the other corner of the ring. This is the free will folks, because that's what the question was about. Uh, Joshua 24, 15, God gave us a choice. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. He lays out two choices in front of them. Would you prefer the gods of your ancestors who, who they served beyond the Euphrates or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Amen. It's my favorite book of the Bible, by the way. Hallelujah. Just joking. It, it is, but not for the reasons you think. Anyway, Joshua, an amazing person. He sets out two different lifestyles in front of them. And he says, you can take curtain number one or curtain number two, which is it going to be? You know what I mean? And this happens not just here, but it also happens in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses does it. He says, I set before you death and life, blessing and a curse. Which one will you choose? What I would contend is that God doesn't say he's giving us a choice and then not give us a choice. So I think even though we need his help to get there, I think we still have a choice. Matthew 23, Jesus wanted the people of Jerusalem, but they rejected him. Verse 37, Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and gathers stones, though, and, and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Jesus wanted them to repent. He wanted them to be Christians. He wanted them to love him and they were not willing. So they stopped it. Acts 7.51, this is Stephen. He's the first martyr in the book of Acts. He's the first one killed for his faith. And he gives a sermon. And in the midst of the sermon, he says these words. You resist God's grace, you stubborn people. You are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Now, this might not be shocking to you. If, if you didn't grow up with the sovereignty of God kind of teaching to where you didn't feel like you had any choice in the matter, you're like, this makes more sense to me. Like, I have the ability to shut it down. But if, if, if you think... If you think all about free will, you might need to be reminded of the depravity of human beings and our slavery. 
If you're somebody who's all about God's sovereignty and he drives the whole thing, you might need to be reminded of the fact that you can resist him. So don't resist. Book of Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, don't reject him. We all need balance on these things. Here's the way I believe this works. So if if you're someone who studies these things or wants to study these things, the verses that I gave you, you're probably just shocked at how few verses I just gave you. For the verses I just gave you, I edited out 30 verses because there's so much Bible on this topic. But I wanted to keep it streamlined and focused today for you. But I'll just encourage you, there's so much to study here. But here is my view on this, and I'll say it with an illustration. Imagine it's the World Series, and this is a baseball sports illustration that I'm not qualified to make, (laughs) but I'm going to attempt it. So I think there's a home plate. Um, Pitches happen, right? It's the World Series. Your team needs a home run. You step up to the plate. The problem is you're about three years old. Good, you're getting it. You see the picture? Problem is you can't even lift that bat. So what are the chances? Like not only that you could get a home run, but execute a swing, definitely gonna not deal with a fastball or a curveball if I got the words right, right? You're not gonna deal with any of that stuff. You're three years old. So what are the chances mathematically that you're gonna get the home run? It's zero, I'll just skip to it. It's zero, you got no chance. That's the biblical idea of a sinner trying to find Jesus on their own. So here's the way the the picture continues to go. You're still at the World Series, the three-year-old standing there, absolutely helpless. And then God himself walks up to the plate, looks at the three-year-old and says, how about I help you with that? Can can we pick up that bat together? How How about you let me hold the bat with you and we'll do this whole swing thing together. How about we do that? And then... What are your mathematical chances now of getting a home run? They went from zero to 100 because God's there and God's going to make this happen. And then here's the final twist. I would say as much as I think that is a, a bit of a picture in human terms of what I think is happening in salvation, there's one step I left out. And that is when God comes to take the bat, I believe he stops and says, do you want this? You can resist me. I will not overpower your will. So if you're, if you're for this, we're going to do this. And when we say words here at church, like you're the one who has to surrender. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I'm the one knocking at the door, but you're the one who has to turn the handle and let me in. And then I'm going to come in and eat with you. I'm going to make this whole thing happen all myself. But you've got to let me I think God gives us the ability, like Jesus said to Jerusalem, we can resist. So sometimes people are so much into the sovereign grace that they they would come up with something called irresistible grace. That's the I in tulip for you academics in the room. I am not a five-point Calvinist. I do not believe in irresistible grace uh, or limited atonement, just in case you're tracking things. Um, I'm about a three-pointer. Um, that could be my Baptist heritage. That's all the, I'll, I'm done. I'm done with all that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but here's the thing. If you had talked to me 10 years ago, I would have shared that illustration, but I would have been a teenager at the plate with maybe a chance. And I needed God's help. And the more I study this, the older I get, the more I walk with Jesus And the more I have to face my own failures as a person, the younger I get in that illustration. I still think I can refuse him because I think he is kind and I think he protects my choice. But that's the only reason it's there. How's everybody doing? We okay? All right. You officially did the theology part. Congratulations. You got through it. Um, but here's the really important part. So our, our question asker person had a great question. They put out there 
um, what about free will? But the way they asked it was, is it possible for me to miss God? And they even said, people come and they, they ask or, or they say, you can't miss God. And I really just kind of kept staring at that question this week. Like, what are they saying? Like, what's the question that's underneath the question here? Can we put that back up, actually? Why do people say that you cannot miss what God has for you? I call bull crud. There's some emotion in that bull crud part, right? Why do people say this to me? Just get underneath it. Why do sometimes over-optimistic Christians who are trying to oversimplify things about God to me, why do they tell me that I can't miss God? And why do they tell me that when I feel like I have missed God or someone that I love missed God? Because I think that's what's going on underneath this question. We don't take names with these questions, so I couldn't sit down and just interview the person. <clears throat> but I think what's going on underneath this question is a word that I would say is regret. I think there's regret underneath this question. I think, I think God got missed. I think God provided a choice. I think God provided a possible blessing for somebody. And it might have been salvation. It might have been something entirely different. And the person missed it. And then when they were talking to another Christian, a well-meaning Christian, that Christian kind of oversimplified the picture for them. And here came their question about free will. Does that make sense? So these are just all my guesses. If you wrote the question and I'm just absolutely destroying your intention, I'm sorry. But I think it's about regret. And so I wanted to take the rest of the message today and talk a little bit about regret and why we regret things, why the mistakes that we make in our past, sometimes we can't let them go. Sometimes those things bother us right down to the ground just so much that we relive and rehash our mistakes from the past over and over again to the point that they bind us up and we can't go forward and live again. You know what regret, regret is. Regret um, is something I think on some level we all face. Linda and I were talking about this weekend, like, okay, who are the people in our lives that, that struggle with regret the most? Like when I think about them, um, and we were judging all of you, I'm just joking, we weren't. Like, but we were just thinking about people that were really, really close to us and just trying to get underneath it. And of course, by the end of the conversation, you're like, it's us, it's us two. Like we've got regret in us. Like there, there's, there's just things from our own past and it just gets to us. Uh, you can't change your past, right? It's, it's in stone. Whatever science fiction says, there are no time machines, right? So like sometimes that's a blessing, right? Like pencil's down, the test is done, you can relax. Like you don't have to go and relive your childhood again, amen? Thank God for that. Even if there were mistakes, I don't want to go back there. Even I think about parenting and our kids are off to college now or, or, or have moved out of our house. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and it's like our parenting is in a sense done. And some of you guys are like, they're going to come back. I know, I know they're going to come back. There's going to be things. I know, I know we're not done, but there's a great sense in, in which we have parented and the preparation and the mentoring and the teaching and the loving and providing, like that's done now and, and, and that's sealed, right? Like signed and sealed, like, like the mistakes that we've made, they're made. And the things we did well, they're locked in. And it's done. Like, like so, some of us, like we think we've got all the way until they're 18. You don't. You hit the teen years. And you try to keep mentoring them and telling them what to do and it doesn't go so well. Yeah. Right? And you realize that the door started to close on your mentoring ability much earlier than anybody told you it was going to. But it's like there's a sense of as soon as that starts to hit you, as soon as the door starts to shut on anything in your life, you immediately feel this sense of like, oh, I wish I had done it better. Yep. Come on. Oh, and I can keep reliving all the things I didn't do. It's just, and that's, 
that's the regular stuff. Like, what about the really big, hard, hard stuff? Like that bad marriage I got into, I regret that. That affair, that business I worked so hard at, and then it failed. And I just can't let that go. Are we getting into the stuff now? Like that night that I came home and I was so stressed out and I crossed that line with my kids or my spouse that I swore to myself I would never cross because they had crossed it and I was never gonna cross it, but then I crossed it. And now I'm trying to live with myself because I crossed it. Regret, I mean, it gets us. And this is, this is part of our life. Um, Hebrews 8, 12 says it like this. God chooses to forget your sins and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. Hallelujah. So God doesn't just forgive you. He doesn't just say, I'm gonna treat you as if you hadn't done the thing in, in my cosmic justice and in our relationship. I'm, I'm gonna go forward as if you didn't do the thing. He says, I'm actually gonna eradicate what you did from my memory. God says that. You're like, well, how can anybody do that? A human being can't. That's right. But an almighty God can he actually select surgically what to remove from his own memory banks? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, he can. Hallelujah. If he's almighty, he can. He's just not gonna, he's just not gonna remember it. And if God can wipe that stuff out from his memory, why can't we? Or why can't we at least let it go? Yes. I, think, I think maybe we should. So 2 Corinthians 7.10 says... Um, Regrets are only good if it grows us up. For the kind of sorrow that God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. So stop right there. He's going to talk about two different kinds of sorrow, two different kinds, what I would call regrets. So he's going to say there's regret number one, which is a godly regret, a godly sorrow. So like there is a, a being smart about I sinned and hurt people over here. I should remember it long enough to want to not do that again. Amen. Amen. Like I should learn from that. That should grow me. It should impact my character. Absolutely. There's a, there's a regret process that I need to spend a temporary amount of time in so that I learn and grow. And he says, that's the kind that leads to repentance. It leads to repentance because I'm not staying in the, in the regret. Notice that? Amen. It's very, very important. He doesn't say live in the regret for the rest of your life. He says that you go through that regret to repentance and you make change. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. So I feel bad about it, but I didn't learn anything from it. I feel guilty but I didn't change. And I'm probably going to stay here and just keep feeling it over and over and over again for the rest of my life, not changing, by the way. And he's like, that's just you dying. Don't do that. That's not God's way. Some of you grew up in a church and you got convinced that God's way was for you to be perpetually guilty about your past. No. I want to acknowledge too, just this whole whole thing, how difficult regret actually is. If you're still awake and still listening, you know just how big of a deal this is. And I've got some more stuff to, to tell you about it right before we close. And it's not gonna be breezy stuff. It's gonna be very direct stuff to those of you who have still got your re regrets clinched into a fist and you refuse to let it go. And I'm going to describe it to you that way because most of the time with our regrets, we don't feel like that's the picture. We feel like regret is a two-ton weight on our shoulders and we can't get it off. But I think it's the opposite. I think we're the ones that are holding on. And so I'm not going to say these next things to you as an attack on you or like you're somehow some kind of special bad Christian case because I'm right there with you. I just want to pry those fingers off. And I hope these truths can help you with that. Um, let's say you bring your hand on the stove. We all know that illustration. You bring your hand on the stove. What are you supposed to do? Real, real basic. You're supposed to stop and say, hmm, hot stoves are bad for my hand. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> Like, have the quick moment of learning. Like, live in the pain for just a second. 
Like, I want, I want this to be a deep lesson, right? Like, I don't want to do that part again. Like, learn the lesson and get back to it. Learn the lesson, get back to cooking, right? What's the unhealthy road? Well, I burn my hand on the stove and then I relive the pain over and over and over again and I replay it. And I just stay there in that place of trauma, no matter how long. We're going to talk about mental health next week, by the way. But I can just live in that place and choose to stay in that place of that trauma, of that pain. Does everybody know just how bad that hurt me? And never let it go. And I could swear off stoves and stovetops for the rest of my life. And I'll never cook again. I'll just eat cold cuts for the rest of my life. God's will is that your past is so forgiven and so forgotten that you start to cook again. Amen. And you start to live again. There you go. Come on. That's what he wants for us. Some of us believe that Jesus Christ died for us so that spiritually speaking, we'd be a walking zombie for the rest of our existence on this earth. He didn't want that for you. He wants you alive. The point was resurrection. Pastor Timothy Keller put it like this. He says, when people say, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself, they mean they have failed an idol whose approval is more important to them than God's. Okay, now here's the deep waters. Here's the deep waters. This is, this is where it's like, let's pry those fingers off. Don't say this to judge anybody. Just to say, I think you're holding on. I think that's what he's saying. You're holding on and you don't know it. But, but there's an idol here. And an idol is anything who is in the top place instead of God. So let's say you married the wrong person, right? Let's say you had the affair. Let's say you got the divorce that you weren't supposed to get. What Keller is trying to say is God has come in and said, if you are submitted to me and you've asked for my forgiveness, you're forgiven, done, over, forgiven. Like there may be consequences in this world, absolutely. But as far as the highest opinion that can ever be, his opinion of you is forgiven. Amen. And that should be period, the end of the story inside of your heart. Yes. But if you're in a place where it can't be the end of the story, if you're in a place where you can't let it go, and could we get underneath that? Is it because there's an old religious parent in the mix who's like, but I see that failure every time I look at you or extended family, or friends. You're like, I see the condemnation in their eyes every single time. What Keller is saying is, you're putting their opinion of you over the opinion of God. You didn't mean to, but that's what you've stumbled into, brother and sister. And the only way you fix that is that in prayer every single day, as God brings this thing up, you say, but God, you say I'm forgiven, even if they don't. Amen. And I value your opinion of me and your view on me over theirs. And I won't, I won't value their, their, their I, I love them, but they're not the final word and the loudest voice in my life. And I gotta, I gotta mentally silence them and I gotta believe God. Do you see how this whole thing is by faith? It, that's, that's a hard step of faith. And maybe it's your, your, your pride that's getting in the way. It's not people pleasing. Maybe it's your pride. It's like, I can't live with myself because I'm the person who did that stuff. I know I did that and I thought better of me before that. And you know what's dying now? The idol that has to come, come down is your view on yourself. And maybe you've got to go to God and you got to face some reality with him. And maybe you got to take reality on the chin a little bit and say, maybe I wasn't as, as impressive as I thought I was. Maybe Jesus is the only impressive one. Amen. And maybe I'm the broken guy who's got a testimony now. Maybe I'm the guy who opens up with other people about how I failed instead of trying to lie to my kids about the fact that I didn't really do wrong against them that day. 
Maybe I just live in the truth with everybody now because now my value is in being a testimony. And all of a sudden Jesus is the star and I'm not. Do you see how all this stuff starts to make sense again? You, we gotta unravel ourselves, guys. This regret's killing us. I was thinking about that hand burning thing. I just felt like God gave this to me at the last minute and just so you know, if you were to, if you were, if you were a writer, right? Like a novel writer and you, you wrote a story about that day where you burned your hand on the stove. How would you write it if you're in regret? Well, I know how I would. The pivotal event in the whole story was the great burning of the hand. And the hero, or at least main character of the whole story, is clearly me. Because the more I focus on that pain and on that regret, the bigger I get in the story, don't I? And the more I fixate on my own past, the more I'm fixating on me. Let it go. Because maybe you're not the main character. Maybe the story is actually his story. And maybe you're a side character who gets to serve some people and gets to love some people and gets to get free of their sin. Just the way Jesus wants you to be free of your sin. Just long enough that you can actually extend love to some others. And as you as a side character, he becomes the hero. Just a thought. C.S. Lewis said, we, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Why don't you guys stand? Let's pray. Jesus, we pray right now for a supernatural release of bondage in this room. God, for those that have not been able to hear your voice up to this point in their life, God, I pray for a, a supernatural drawing work of God the Father to their soul. God, draw them, speak to them, call them out, Lord God. Save them, Lord God. Help us not to refuse you. Mm. And God, for those of us that are bound up in regret, all of us that are bound up in regret, I pray that we would let it go and that we would choose to obey the voice of our master, to believe your perspective on us. Set us free, Jesus, in Christ's name.